Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by a very special guest, Jason Pfeiffer. Jason is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine and is host of three podcasts, Problem Solvers, Hush Money, and the one we're going to talk about today, Pessimist Archive. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So Jason, but by way of introduction, uh, before we even get into the Pessimist Archive, how do you sort of um, what is the thread that ties all your interests together or the thread that you've uh, you've kept pulling uh, when you look back at the arc of, of your career and, and where it's going? So it's funny. Uh, my, the arc of my career has been one of change and of riding and finding opportunity in change, but I didn't actually turn a lens on that and realize that the thing that I was really interested in was change and how it happens and how people find opportunity in it until a little bit later. The way that I tend to work is that I throw a ton of things up in the air. (laughs) Like I just get involved in things without thinking about what the ROI is of it or how it even fits into what my idea of myself is. As long as I'm interested in it, I pursue it. And then afterwards, I start trying to tie the things together or figure out what they have in common. And what I've realized is that that's the thing that I'm kind of obsessed with. At Entrepreneur, I've really made it a brand and a magazine that's all about change and understanding how change happens. And I've I, I, my thesis is that the thing that makes entrepreneurs successful is their ability to adapt to change. And then with the research that I do with Pessimist Archive, which we could talk, you know, we'll talk about, it's, it's a this kind of exploration of change throughout history and why people resist innovation. And I realize that that is also lessons in how change happens. And so that's where I've leaned heavily into is, is thinking a lot about that. And, and before we go deep on, on that podcast specifically, how, how do you think the three podcasts uh, inter- intersect with each other? So they do in one way, which is that, like I said, they're, they're all in some way or another about change. But I'll be honest, the real opportunity here was that I, I see getting into things sometimes as a lead in to other things. So very quickly, my history with podcasting is back in 2016, I was a heavy podcast consumer and I felt like this is something I want to learn how to do myself. And I feel like it would be a great writing challenge. And so I launched Pessimist Archive because that was a subject that I was just really fascinated by. Why do fears that we have about new things echo in history? Why are we repeating our fears across time? And so I launched that show. And, and it's, a, it's a highly, pre- everything that I do is, is, is produced. I, I, you know, it's not an interview show. These are like, I spend two months researching and interviewing. And then I put together like a six to 8,000 word script. It's like way more work than I really bargained for. And I didn't know what the point of it was, honestly. Like, why was I making this outside of that? I wanted to make it. And now I understand it because I've seen what's happened. And what's happened is that one, it taught me how to podcast. So when I was at Entrepreneur and we wanted to get into podcasting, I said, well, I know how to do this. Why don't I launch our first show, which is where Problem Solvers came from. It was really me leading the brand into podcasting by launching something that I knew how to make. And then later on, Hush Money became really something of an IP play. I I teamed up with a friend of mine named Nicole Lappin and we built something that we hope can translate it to television. Uh, But Pessimist Archive then also became something of a community builder for me. It introduced me to this world of tech policy people and investors and entrepreneurs who are really excited about the show. And that has led to amazing new opportunities. And then also, frankly, it's become something of an IP play as well. I'm about to, you know, we're, we're talking at the end of October and a lot of things are like about to change for me. And one of them is that I am about to shop a, a book proposal that I've been working on for months and months and months. And it's, it's very much based on the research that I've done in Pessimist Archive. So I see these things as you get into them, you learn, you develop new skills, and then you figure out later what it's good for. Let's get into Pessimist Archive. What, what, what inspired you to, to start it? How has it evolved since, since you've created it? And, and what, are you, what, are you, uh, what, what message or learning are you trying to introduce to the world? Through that and yeah. The book. 
So, right. And so, by the way, also speaking of change and change that's happening for me right now, um, this is this is like breaking news because I haven't talked about it in public anywhere else. So here you have, uh, <laughs> um, which is that we're I'm actually in the middle of a rebrand. So this show has been around for four years. It has a really strong audience. But um, but, you know, as you might have heard, if you're if you're listening to this right now, you don't know what Pessimist Archive is yet, you're going to assume it's pessimistic. And that just that was just a problem I kept running into where people thought that the show was a downer or that the show was ultimately pessimistic about the world. And it's not. It's actually an extremely optimistic show. The idea was Pessimist Archive, an archive of the pessimists who look back in time at people who were pessimistic in the past. But it just just I, I just felt like it, we needed to lean into the optimism and avoid this confusion and also really embrace the way that the show has gone, which is that it's really an exploration of change. So I don't have a new name, but if you search for the show as Pessimist Archive, it will, you will continue to come up even if we change the name because I'll keep Pessimist Archive in the title for, for at least a year or two. So anyway, all that said, here's the thing. When years and years and years ago, I was working at Fast Company and one day I stumbled upon an article from like, I can't remember, the 20s or something. And they were talking about was somebody writing about the younger generation of the time. And it was exactly what people said about millennials, it, like today, exactly, like just word for word, right? And I thought to myself, well, this is absurd. It's absurd that people of the past were talking about a genera- the next generation, and then the next generation clearly grew up and then just said the same thing about the next generation, and then that generation grew up and said the same thing. And like now here we are with old, the older generation talking about millennials like this. And I was like, this is nuts. Is this what we do with everything? And so I just started digging into it. And, and the answer is, yeah. It's so what we do with everything. I mean, just the way that the way that people talk about radio is the way that people talk about social media now. I mean, you just you can just draw these parallels back and back and back and back and back. And I became fascinated by this. Why do we do this? And why is why are we we the people who live now who grew up on the technology that we grew up with, which was opposed by the previous generation, but like we think it's totally fine. Like, why do we continue to forget what? people used to say about the stuff that we're familiar with now and then we pass those same fears on to the next generation it seems crazy to me and i was just i just needed to understand it and the podcast was a great way to explore it so i uh let, let's go through a few a few examples because you have a few colorful uh, colorful episodes why sure. don't we um start with uh with chess and the bicycle yeah sure so Okay. Uh, I mean, there are uh, what what often happens is that something comes out, something new is introduced, and it is opposed in waves, uh, and it is and and it the opposition will change depending on how popular the thing gets. So there's like early opposition, and then there's mainstream opposition, um, and so just very quickly, like some slices of that. A thing about chess across time, um, because chess moved around the globe quite a bit and evolved was that either governmental leaders or just the thinkers of the day were worried that chess was was like an unhealthy completely counterproductive obsession of people that that they would sit down and they would waste all of this time on this completely meaningless thing instead of doing something that was more meaningful and we hear versions of that today right i mean there's like oh it's to put down the video games or put down the whatever right because people couldn't imagine that playing a game of strategy could be good for your brain. They, they only saw it as a distraction, a kind of bad thing. And so you can go back and find these old Scientific American articles, which are hilarious, talking about how much of like an unnecessary brain drain chess is, right? And now we think of it, of course, as, as a real training for your brain. Um, bicycles had so similar but different opposition there was there were a lot of people this is a kind of common concern is for anything that that involves movement or transportation is that people feared that we physically couldn't handle the 
movement of the bicycle. So give you a couple of things. Like, first of all, people were concerned that the, like our bodies moving at that speed in the open air would damage our, our, our bodies and our faces. There was something called bicycle face, which was the fear that this like wind blowing in your face was going to permanently stretch out your face. But also there's a lot of articles back then about, and you know, we're talking about kind of turn of the century, a lot of articles about how the rotation of the bicycle, the constant rotation of this wheel is so unnatural to our brains that it will actually make us insane and homicidal. Quite a lot of articles about the, how the bicycle would make us homicidal. And, and I want to, I want to posit that that is not an isolated fear that you hear versions of that now, because I think a lot of the premise of, oh, social media is awful and it's hacking our brain and checkmate against humanity or whatever ridiculous thing Tristan Harris says, like that's all premised upon this belief that we are biologically not built to withstand something new. That if you put us in front of something new, be it the bicycle or be it social media, that our bodies are overpowered by it. That we are just fragile creatures who cannot adapt to what is in front of us. And of course, that has just been proven untrue over and over and over again. And the bicycle is a really clear example of that. I want to get to just on in a couple of minutes. But first, um, which one is, uh, which is your favorite example that sort of illustrates our, you know, just sort of silliness around you know, uh, seeing new technologies and, and yeah, I, you know, so I have a, I have a number of them, but actually there's this, there's this one anecdote about the bicycle that I I think is really valuable for people in business to hear. So let me tell you about it. 1896 bicycle, totally new. And it is changing commerce because of course, when something new comes out and it changes people's habits that can ripple out in ways that are unexpected. And there's this wonderful article from 1896. I, I just, I love it so, so much in which this reporter goes around talking to different merchants who have been impacted by the bicycle. And so, for example, he talks to the bar owners. The bar owners are very upset about the bicycle because people aren't drinking as much like beer in the middle of the day anymore because now they're drinking water because they're riding the bicycle. And he talks to the cobblers. Cobblers very upset because the cobblers aren't selling as many like heavy shoes because now these cyclists are wearing these lighter shoes so that they can get around on the bicycle. And then he talks to, and this is the best part, this is this is the just the shining light in this 1896 piece. He talks to the fancy felt hack guy. And the fancy felt hat guy is furious that people are not buying as many fancy felt hats because now, of course, they're buying these cycling caps because they're riding the bicycle. And so he proposes in this article, the fancy felt hat guy proposes a law that Congress should pass a law mandating that every cyclist buy two fancy felt hats a year to compensate him for the loss of sales. And when I tell this story on stage back in a world in which I was able to stand on a stage and tell stories, people would laugh. And then I would say, you know, it's worth laughing at that, but it's also worth remembering that we are all guilty of that. Like we are all guilty of looking at change and saying, no, 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 no. Like I I am not changing. You change. I'm fine right here. In fact, I'm so good. And the thing that I'm doing is so important that we, we should, we should protect this thing and make sure that everything else changes. And that's not how the world works, right? That's how we continually respond to change, but it's not how the world actually works. And in fact, had that fancy felt hat guy not thought of himself as a fancy felt hat guy, but instead just thought of himself as a hat guy, right? Like I, I'm not interested in fancy, I'm just interested in putting something on your head. Whatever you need on your head, I will make it. I will put it on your head. Well, that guy would have made a killing because if you look at the numbers right now, and I have, as it turns out, the hat, the hat and cap industry right now is double the size of the bicycle. There was such a killing to be made in pivoting into hats for these new kinds of needs. And that guy totally missed the boat. And that is such a classic lesson to me about how change happens and how people in resisting it actually miss out on the opportunity. That's a, that's a great story. I, I want to transition to, to social media, but, but even zooming out just on how people have perceived revolutions in communication uh, over time, maybe, maybe the novel uh, as one example or, or any others. And then let's get into what's, what's right and wrong about the social media debate we're having. Sure. I, I mean, the the thing about communication is that people are constantly doubting 
the need for new kinds of communication. So a lot of the stuff that people say about the internet now, or certainly said about the internet in the earlier days of the internet, when it was kind of a simpler thing to wrap your head around, is uh, were things that people said about the telegraph. So telegraph comes along. It is the very first, I mean, just consider the unbelievable revolutionary concept of the telegraph. I mean, you know, we, we like to flatter ourselves in thinking that we live in interesting times, but like, you know, we're, we we are not living through like the greatest change that humans have ever seen, right? I mean, imagine imagine being alive at the moment in which, after just you know tens of thousands of years of of humanity as we know it, suddenly for the very first time, you are able to send information faster than physical travel. It's a revolutionary idea, and yet you had all of these people instantly back then, instantly start complaining. And their complaints were like fascinating. So some of them are, are very, you know, they're very, very familiar. They're all, all in some ways very familiar to today. So there was a guy who stood up at, there's Sam, you know, Samuel Morris, uh, um, uh, kind of noted inventor of the Telegraph, or the, the, the guy who kind of uh, brought it to market, brought the technology to market. And uh, at his retirement party, a guy stood up, everyone was toasting Samuel Morris. And then this guy stands up and instead of toasting Samuel Morris, just starts complaining about all the, the, about all the ways in which the telegraph has made his life busier, too busy. Now life moves too fast. There's you know, too much speed in life. Why can't we slow down? Why can't we go back to the way things were, right? These don't, this doesn't this sound totally familiar. And his argument was like, well, now, you know, I used to leave the office and that would be it. No, there would be nothing else to do. But now information can arrive at my office at any time from anywhere. And I got to deal with it. You know, that, that's a reasonable complaint, but it just also goes to show you that when we talk about like, oh, life is moving too fast, we all need to move, like we've been talking about that forever. Um, but, but, and then there was another one, um, one of the transcendentalists, I, I think it was Thoreau, I'm almost positive it was Thoreau, has this wonderful little riff about how now, I think it was Maine and Texas can communicate, but what if Maine and Texas have nothing important to share with each other, <laughs> right? And, and you know what? It's possible that maybe at the time, Maine and Texas did have nothing important to share with each other. I have no idea. But the thing is that once you open lines of communication, they will find important things to share with each other. We tend to not be able to, and this is just something that we see over and over again, whether it's the telegraph or or novels, which novels were, were often talked about in the same way that we talk about like video games right now, right? What a terrible influence on children. Oh, these novels are going to make children violent. They're going to read all these stories. And oh, women are now going to be, they're, they're like uh, uh, fixed reserves of energy in their bodies, because this is, this is the understanding of science at the time, um, is, are going to be depleted by getting emotionally invested in these stories and these women's bodies are going to start breaking down, right? It's like, like totally okay. nuts stuff. But what, it, but what it's all premised on, I think, is this belief that, that what we have is all we should have, right? That like at any one time, we're, we're going to hit pause and say, what we've got right now is perfect. And there's absolutely no need for anything else. And in fact, if we start to ingest more information, if we create more opportunities for people to communicate, well, then all we're going to do is create noise and we're going to destroy our bodies and our minds. That's the feeling that we have. And, and I, I would argue that that's exactly what you still see see people say today. We keep having this idea that we are at the limit, that we have, we have built it as far as it's going to go and any further is going to be disaster. And of course, that's just, it's just never been shown to be true. I think that there is an infinite possibility of things that we can build. So let, let's go into the social media debate. Obviously, where the social, the movie Social Dilemma you know, just, just mm-hmm. came out. You know, Tristan Harris as, uh, has become very famous, and him and others, you know, including early Facebook employees critiquing the company and, and social media at large. When you look at his sort of array of arguments, where is he wrong and which ones do, uh, do you sympathize with um, or think that there's a, you know, an angle of, 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 of rightness, uh, if any? So the first thing I want to do is, is take issue with the tone. And that's because I, I feel like Tristan and his compadres are they're operating on the idea that that the way to draw attention to something is to make it seem as scary as possible as just as just completely 
terrifying and villainous as possible. I mean, this like checkmate against humanity or whatever he says is so absurd. And, and I think it's just so counterproductive, you know, over and over and over again, what you see across time is that people have some concern about something and it very quickly escalates into this is literally the end of humanity. I mean, it's just what people say over and over again. And I think that Tristan either willfully or ignorantly, and, and I really, I, do, I don't know if I should be giving him the benefit of the doubt because of this moment in the social dilemma that I feel like was really telling, which I'll explain in a second, seems to be unable or unwilling to acknowledge that he is joining a pattern of hundreds of years of fear-mongering about innovation in a way that's never been constructive. And I think is, is ultimately just a slowing down of innovation. So the moment that I'm referring to is the moment in which Tristan looks directly at the camera and in this very self-satisfied way says, nobody ever said anything bad about the bicycle. Nobody ever said that the bicycle was going to destroy humanity. And, you know, that's just... Uh, that's just not true. It's just not true. And I mean, you can find so many different crazy arguments about the bicycle that it was going to lead to a moral decline in America because people weren't going to go to church anymore. That it was um, that it was going to fray the the you know the fabric of society because it was uh, it was going to enable women to have um, free access to the world. And what a terrible thing that is. I mean, there were a million reasons that people said that the bicycle was going to destroy humanity. And I can't figure out from Tristan if he is literally unaware of that. I mean, he, he said it to camera as if he was completely positive that nobody had ever said this stuff about the bicycle. Or if he just thinks that people are so stupid that they're going to fall for, fall for the, the messaging. But I find it really deeply offensive. I think that there are, to, to get to where, um, where, you know, where I think that he, he has reason. I, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's reason to be concerned about people, the, the way that the people who have built social media took a uh, like a completely hands off approach on their own products in, in a way that I just think was bad for business like y- you should be constantly aware of how your product is succeeding and also how it's failing its users and be more mindful about how you can constantly build a better product and and I and I feel like the way in which social media has been abused to spread misinformation is something that is that th- that the the creators of you know the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world should be should be more aware of in in a way in which they seem to all have woken up to more recently. But like, you know, the, the, but then he'll, but then he'll go into these insane things that I, I just like fundamentally disagree with about how villainous it is to create products that are so compelling and addictive is the word that he uses and that everybody uses. But you can, again, you can could just, you can go back far, far, far. You can find people talking about radio addiction and novel addiction, right? Like it's not addiction, it's overuse. There's like a, such a distinction between those two things that we just keep using the word addiction as if we're talking about actual clinical addiction and that's not the case. But anyway, like what he's arguing against is creating better products. I mean, uh, that just seems nuts to me. You, you, you know, you want to make the best podcast possible. You want to make a podcast that's so good that people are going to listen to the next po- podcast. That's not a problem. There's no problem with people creating things that are good. And so I think that he like he's always looking for these opportunities to take something that I think is fairly natural in the creation of, of, of a product and also fairly natural in just the, the habits and usage of new innovations that we would see across time and making them seem scary and villainous in a way that I really don't understand what the point is, except I guess maybe to make money off of talks. Like I just don't know. And, and what do you make? Uh, how, how do you make sense of the early Facebook employees? You know, the handful or so that that are that are involved. Is it? Do you think they're just fundamentally confused? <laughs> I, no, I think that if you look back in time, what you see is that there's always going to be some people who are ultimately concerned about some new thing in the world, and so. Yeah, I mean, Facebook is, I don't know how many Facebook employees there have been, but, you know, I mean, we would have to assume in the many thousands, tens of thousands, who knows, I don't, I don't know how many people have worked at Facebook, but um, that there were some of them that have decided that, that they buy into a different narrative, that they've created something that's bad. I mean, that just doesn't strike me as surprising. I mean, it would be, I think it would be shocking if nobody 
said it. Of course, somebody's going to say it. Um, so it just, it doesn't feel all that compelling to me that like a handful of people out of the bazillion people who have worked for all of these companies have, um, have banded together to kind of drive a different narrative. And, you know, it's, it's, it's compelling. Of course, it's compelling. Anytime somebody comes from something and then turns against that thing, you feel like, oh, well, this person knows something that none of us know. And, but, you know, I mean, they, they understand, uh, you know, they understand more about the inside mechanics of Facebook than I certainly do. I mean, I, I would not claim to be, uh, have a sophisticated knowledge of exactly how Facebook works, but, but I do feel like after studying resistance of innovation across time, I feel like I have a pretty good handle on how societies react to new things. And what I'm just seeing is a, is an echo of everything that I've seen before. And it doesn't, surprise me or feel all that compelling that a couple of those voices happen to work at the companies that they're now campaigning against. Really? What about the times, and maybe these times are just so, so very few that they're the exceptions that prove the rule, where where there was concern and, and or there was almost under concern, but, but the thing actually did end up dangerous. So maybe it's like cigarettes, or maybe it's like communism, right? I mean, McCarthyism, like people <laughs> at the time thought that we were, we were over, people were overreacting and that, oh, you know, it's so, you know, communist isn't bad at such and such, such and other sort of ideologies and like what are counter examples and do they just prove the rule or how do you make sense of them? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I have a couple of anecdotes for you that I think speak to that. Let me tell you first about the waltz, which I know doesn't sound anything like Facebook, but it is going to get there. So the waltz, 1800s, completely scandalous dance. People are opposed to it in all sorts of ways. I mean, here we are, dancers are touching each other. What a disgusting thing. But the thing that was really, that's all to be expected, right? I mean, like the things that people said about the waltz, they said about like twerking, right? It was like the same conversation. But the thing that I I found completely fascinating was all of these claims by doctors of the time that the waltz was going to take literal years off of people's lives that the waltz was physically damaging to your health. And that there were even doctors who had like specific numbers, right? Like if, if, a, if a woman is a, is a regular waltzer, she's going to lose seven years off of her life or whatever. And so I talked to this dance historian about this because I was really curious what was going on there. Because my hypothesis was that this was just straight up fear mongering, that the thing that these doctors were doing were trying to figure out how to communicate with their gravitas, some kind of weird whipped up rationale for what is ultimately a moral concern that they were just, they just didn't like that people were touching during the waltz. And the historian said, no, not the case. The thing is the waltz actually was damaging to people's health, just not in the way that the doctors expected or understood it to be. Because what was happening (laughs) is that The waltz was being performed in these unventilated rooms. This was long before air conditioning or an understanding of ventilation had come along. And they were dancing on this particular kind of rug that would collect all of this dust and then just kick it up into people's faces as they were dancing. And then they were all wearing super restrictive clothing. So you got yourself a hot, unventilated room, like full of dust, and everybody's like being choked to death by their clothing. Yeah, of course this is bad. The thing is, though, that the waltz wasn't the thing that was bad. It was everything around the waltz. So this is the thing that I tend to see across time when people are identified. They're identifying what is and can be seen as a very, there is a problem right? People, people have a problem. There, there's something to be said here, and there's some reason to be concerned, but they're often jumping to the conclusion that the thing that is causing the problem is whatever the newest thing is that's in front of them. And that is generally where you lose the thread and where you actually stop being able to identify good solutions. So now let's take that idea and let's move it to Facebook. If you remember years ago, not that many years ago, but like a couple of years ago, people talked a lot about Facebook depression. It, it was something you would yep. see on like like local TV news all the time, right? Like tonight at 11, there's a new concern among, among doctors and it's Facebook depression. And what is Facebook depression? Facebook depression is this idea that your teenager is going to go and spend all this time on Facebook and then they're going to get depressed, clinically depressed. And this is based off of early science in which there was an identified, what it seemed to be, causation 
between teenagers uh, and their their usage of Facebook and their uh, rates of depression. And so this sounds very, very concerning, right? And if you wanted to take some kind of action and say, and, and you know, help your child, which of course any parent would want to do, then the natural thing to do would be to remove your child from Facebook. Except that that wasn't really correct science. And that is not the fault of the scientists because this is the thing about science is that science is a evolving process. I talked to this woman, her name is Amy Orban. She's a, she's a really fascinating researcher who's primary area of research is social media uh, impact on children. And she's, um, she's a, a, at Cambridge. And she has done a very deep, very thorough review of all the early research into Facebook uh, and, and social media impact on children. And what she found was that, first of all, to the degree that you can identify a connection between usage, Facebook usage and depression, what you're actually seeing is a correlation, not a causation. And also it was a very selective reading of publicly available data, which was mostly self-reported. So it was mostly out of people, you know, like a researcher calling somebody up and being like, how many hours a day do you use Facebook? And like, I mean, how could you, I, I don't use Facebook very much, but I'm like on Instagram all the time. But if you ask me how many hours a day I use Instagram, I couldn't tell you how many, I don't know. I'm not like clocking it in. So we already have pretty rough data here. And once she had done a deeper dive on the data, um, which is something that, of course, science, this, this is a, a normal part of the scientific process is that a study comes out and then some other scientists like dig into the data and see if it's, uh, if it's correct. Uh, what she found was that um, there really is no connection um, outside, of, um, outside of some kind of vague uh, correlation, but not causation. And, um, and, that, uh, and that actually, if you, if you were to rank um, kind of impact on well-being, that usage of social media ranks around eating a potato. And so now that you see this, what do we make of it? Well, what we can make of it is this. One, we understand that what generally happens in science is that it takes a while, but in what Amy Orban calls the Sisyphean cycle of tech panic, uh, what, what we tend to do as a culture is we panic about something, which then leads to politicians getting involved, which then means that they're starting to demand some kind of action, which means that money starts freeing up for research, and then researchers jump in trying to uh, identify um, problems and, 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 and kind of be part of this cultural conversation. And then the very first results are the things that get run back to the politicians who then wave it around and say, aha, we have the problem, even though that's early drafts of science and later drafts of science will, of course, find something else. So that's what we did with, with, Facebook, with Facebook depression. And now to this point about identifying the wrong problem and then coming to the wrong solution. So now imagine that you have a, a child who you're concerned that they are depressed and you think that Facebook is causing that depression. Well, you might, again, reasonably assume that the solution here is to take them off of Facebook. But what if it turns out Facebook's not the problem? What if it turns out that, in fact, Facebook is a place where this child who is depressed, who has a clinical depression, which is not caused by Facebook, but they're finding a community that's actually quite useful for them on Facebook. Well, now you have taken a solution of theirs and you have taken it away. You have made things worse because you thought that that was the solution. And this is the problem that I see over and over again. It's not to say that things are perfect and it's not to say that we're all living in hunky-dory times all the time, but it is to say that when you jump very quickly from identifying a problem to blaming it on the newest thing in front of you, you often create more harm than you meant to. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great, great anecdote. How, how do you think it applies to ideologies? Just curious, you know, over the last, you know, four or five years or so, is, is certainly this presidency, we've seen people who are concerned about a rise of fascism. And then conversely, uh, and especially recently, we've seen people who are concerned about sort of the resurgence of, of communism in, in, in different ways. Would we apply the same sort of, uh, you know, Jason Pfeiffer framework of, hey, people often, people are always scared about the, the rise of these certain things. How, how, how do we... How do we know when this time is different? Or what, what, what framework would you use there? Yeah, well, so the very first thing that I would do is I would look back in time and see, did we have similar challenges without the technology that we had today? And the, the answer is yes. I interviewed 
this guy, a uh, fascinating guy named David Scheimer, who wrote a book called Rigged, which is about the hundred years of um, American and Russian election interference. And the argument that he very clearly lays out, which is born out of interviewing 130 something former officials, including I think seven former CIA directors and a former KGB uh, official, is that the tactics that Russia used in 2016 and are using again today in 2020 are not at all different from the tactics that they had been using on us for decades. And he has a million examples of that. They were utilizing whatever the technology of the day was, which, you know, at the time was radio or newspapers, the printing press, basically anything that Russia could get their hands on. The way he said it is, look, um, election meddling is not a technologically sophisticated uh, procedure. Um, but of course, you will. You, Russia will use, and America, frankly, of course, because America has meddled in all sorts of elections around the world, will use whatever tools are available to them. And so if that's the case, and if Russia has been working to destabilize American democracy for 100 years, well, then I don't think that it's reasonable to say that if you throw Mark Zuckerberg in jail and shut down Facebook, that you're going to solve the problem. You're not. That's not to say that Facebook doesn't play some role today in disseminating misinformation and that Facebook shouldn't be responsible today about making sure that their platform is being used responsibly. But if we simplify the problem down to social media is causing this problem, then we're not able to see the actual problem, which is actually very long and very systemic. And also something that we just seem completely unprepared to deal with. I mean, right, Russia has faced basically zero consequences for what they've done. And if something, if, if a bad actor acts in bad faith and faces zero consequences in anything, that is basically an encouragement for them to go continue to do it. Uh, and so, I mean, there's, you see that in the legal system today, right? I mean, lawyers can basically lie out of their asses and they're never, ever punished for it, which is basically an encouragement for them to continue to lie out of their asses. So this is something that we need to actually solve systemically. And if you just focus on Facebook, you're missing the problem. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's just interesting because there, there are sort of technologies that, that come out that people like in the beginning and then you know, have problems with uh, later on. And I wonder if Facebook's actually one of them where, you know, people loved it during sort of the Obama presidency and, and sort of early years in, in, in some in sort of, you know, social media in general with the, the Arab Spring and stuff like that. And then it seems different people, you know, beca- beca- became president and, and took power and, and cer- certain things happened, whether, you know, real and or uh, ima- imagined that changed the perception of it and, and, and vice versa. I imagine, yeah, there are things that were, or, or you cover a lot of things that were not unliked when they first came out. And then, you know, we all love the bicycle. We all love chess, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's right. And also, you know, the usage changes. And it's really interesting to see how as users of a particular innovation shift, so shifts public perception in part, you know, reasonably so because the innovation then becomes used in different ways. But, you know, I'll give you like, just to go, to go back to the bicycle. So, um, so the bicycle used to be um, used to be called the dandy horse, uh, and um, and th- th- there was there were like a number of different kind of derogatory terms. So there was the dandy horse, um, which was people. It was a kind of a way to make fun of people who rode the bicycle because they all looked like dandies. Um, the sort of language of the day, and then later there were scorchers. Scorchers, like you can go back into the early 1900s newspapers and find all these articles about scorchers. Scorchers were people who were, um, who were like just blazing down sidewalks or roads on bicycles, and um, people would have to like clear out of the way, and they were so dangerous. Scorchers, scorchers. Anyway, so what are you seeing? Well, what you're seeing is, uh, is is a cultural response to the early users of the bicycle. So the early users of the bicycle were the people who could afford the bicycle. The bicycle was expensive at the time, as often new innovations are. And so uh, the people who were using them were wealthy and there was really no like use for it, right? Like we didn't, there was no idea of commuting to work on a bicycle. Like there was no purpose to this thing at the time. It was brand new. People didn't know what to do with it. And so what they did with this is they like took joy rides out into, into areas that people were not familiar with this thing. And they were being kind of reckless with it because they were a bunch of rich jerks. And so people of course hated the thing. And then a shift happened. And the shift was that the bicycle went mainstream. 
it, it the costs were lowered. And so the average person could then ride the bicycle. And, uh, and then the car came along. And so all the wealthy people basically abandoned the bicycle. This was no longer a cool toy for them. They moved on to the car and then they started to be, um, they started to get very derogatory towards the bicycle, this thing that they liked because now there were other people using the bicycle. And so the reason I bring that up is because, you know, it, it is, it's interesting that I, I, one difference I think between 2016 and, and 2020 um, or, you know, or prior to 2016, you know, I think you were right in identifying like the you know, Obama era um, w- with Facebook is that, um, is that Facebook was the, u- the user base was younger and, um, and probably uh, less kind of like politically minded and they were just doing different things with Facebook. And then the youth like moved on to other platforms and that left like my parents on Facebook and Facebook, very mindful, um, and reporting has borne this out, you know, very mindful that its audience is now kind of older and more conservative. I think it's also, I, I don't think that they did it very well, but they were clearly trying to not, they're tr- clearly trying to like cater to their audience. And, uh, and so, you know, what, what, you, what you see is, is that the, I think that the, use, the ways that an innovation is used and then the perception of that innovation um, it w- will adjust as the user base adjusts as well. Say more about in the next five to 10 years, how do you expect perception of social media to, to evolve? That's a really good question. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think I, I'm really resistant to predicting the future because I think that the, 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 one of the main takeaways that I have of my research is that people are just extremely bad about predicting the future. And so I don't want to fall into the trap of just being one other idiot saying something that's going to happen. That's not actually going to happen. But, but, but I'll share this one observation, which is that I, I find the thing that I find most fascinating about TikTok is that TikTok is an extremely popular social media platform that is not really based around building and engaging with your own network, right? Like when you open TikTok, the first thing you see isn't generally the people that you follow. It's just random people. It's like people that the algorithm thinks that you're going to like. And that could say, and I, I really emphasize could because I don't know anything about the future, but that could tell you something about a shift in the way that social media is operating. Because, you know, we started with this idea of, it's just your friends and it's just your community and you're just going to share information. And then it kind of expanded and it was like, it's your friends and other people and you're going to share some information, but you're also like the personal information, but you're also just going to share like your opinions on stuff. We keep, I think, getting further and further away from the original idea of intimate connections and more towards creation where we're creating things with an idea of how it could be consumed by an audience. And then we're leaving the actual direct contact to other platforms like WhatsApp, where we're just directly in touch with our friends. And so what you could see is a fracturing of social media where the things that, uh, where like the, 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 you know, the platforms of the future are largely driven by creators. And I think it makes it as easy as possible for anybody to be a creator. Right? Like the brilliant thing about TikTok is that it has these very, very simple tools that enable the just like a world of super random people to suddenly become amazing comedians, right? Like just the creativity on this thing is so wonderful. And then at the same time, there are other platforms where we're maintaining that idea of direct communication, but we're doing it in a way that isn't like archived and saved and is more casual and intimate. And, you know, who knows? I, I, I think that the only thing that I can feel comfortable saying is that in the very small amount of time that we've had what we would think of as modern social media, we've seen a constant evolution in the way that these things are used by people and, the thing, and, and what people want from them. And I don't know exactly where it's going to evolve, but I can pretty damn well guarantee that it will continue to evolve. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, the group pushing back against techno- uh, against social media right now, it, it seems to be mostly, although it's actually kind of bipartisan, but it, it feels like progressives have been very strong. And you would think that if, if they're progressive, they're comfortable with change. And so I'm curious if uh, people who are more open or, or less open to, to technology, change, you know, have a certain political bent or other sort of common uh, defining characteristics uh, or criteria that you've uh, you've identified in your research. 
Well, so this is a super fascinating question, and I don't have a great answer to it at all. If, if you if you have thoughts on this, I would really love to hear them. I'll tell you my my kind of surprising observation, which was that when I when I started putting Pessimist Archive out, I really didn't think of it as aligning with anybody's particular ideology. But uh, I did have that assumption that you just articulated, which is that I thought that the I thought that the listener base would tend towards being liberal just because I, I think of liberals as being more open to change. I think of conservatives as being more resistant to change. Um, and, uh, and, and what I found was two things. One, we just did, I hired a consultancy to do a deep dive on the audience so that I could understand who was listening and why they were listening. And I, I, the, the woman who was a consultancy, by the way, just shout out pen name consulting. It just did an amazing job. And the woman who led the research sent me this note, which I, I, I wish I could like recite off the top of my head, but it was so interesting. She said, this audience is the most diverse audience of any product or podcast or anything that she's done research on. And then she just like ticked off this like wide, crazy wide range of people from like, from like, like old men in New Hampshire who were trying to build a like a separatist state to uh, LGBTQ activists in Belgium to like it was just it was like everybody right it was she just like the list was the most random grouping of people which was totally amazing uh, and and I you know I really loved it and so in that way it validated this idea that I had hoped for which was that there was there's no real partisan connection to to a, a, a kind of pro-innovation and, and progress message. But I will also note this. I got a DM two years ago from uh, a guy named Taylor at Stand Together, which is the umbrella organization under which, um, you know, far more Stand Together is not really broadly recognizable, but the Charles Koch Institute is broadly recognizable. Um, so, you know, it's a libertarian organization. And I had no idea, but it turns out that this show is huge in libertarian circles, like just absolutely huge. Like, every, you know, like everybody at Reasons listening to it, the Mercatus Center is listening to it. And, uh, and, and Stand Together wanted to write us a grant and to, to just support the show, right? No editorial involvement whatsoever, just like, you know, how can we help you grow? And, and that was fascinating to me. And, and as I've talked to more and more people, I've discovered that this message, it, it, if it aligns directly with any particular party or ideology, it turns out to be libertarianism, which I, I didn't know. I don't think of myself as a libertarian. Like I just, that was way off my radar, but it was super fascinating to find out that there is, there is a community that feels like this message is actually um, uh, uh, just like a, a, a kind of slots right into their belief system and it's libertarians. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm clearly also speaking to people across the spectrum. Yeah, my, my, my pet theory on on, on, uh, I, on on sort of different political tribes is and this is you know a simplification, but I think conservatives are are largely upset at social media right now because they think it's sort of rigged against them, and and they, they you know they might be correct on it. I'm not going to make a statement on it. I, I think uh, on the progressives have a sort of broader uh, theory, which is I think they are uh, you know broadly I think there's you know competing forces uh, uh, you know between uh, sort of software eats the world, I, you know, meritocracy eats the world, and then sort of this, you know, broader egalitarianism uh, e eating the world and the, and the world just progressing, you know, making more and more progress, um, sort of, uh, you know, from a social justice perspective. And I think that, that they are, the progressives are against technology to the extent that they are, one, you know, more on the meritocratic uh, side of things, and, and two, outside of their control. So one common example, one example of this might be something like eugenics, which, if anyone is against eugenics, it's it's the progressives, I, I think. And eugenics even is 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 so tainted as, as a word. But my understanding, which is very limited to be sure, my understanding is that in the 30s and 40s, eugenics was fundamentally a progressive progressive project. And I think that today, you know, a, a, an analogy might be sort of CRISPR. I think uh, you know, progressive might might be sort of leading the front um, in terms of. Uh, you know, wanting to, you know, contain it, uh, et cetera, and not just Christopher, but AI, maybe other technologies, and, and that's smart to do. Uh, and, and, and I think they might be scared about it. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, the word eugenics is, is a bad word. But I think once government has control over it, I, I think they'll be in favor of it. <laughs> once it can, that technology can be used for egalitarian ends, um, mm. I think it will, it will then become a, a capital G good thing. That's my sort of huh. pet theory simplification.
Oh, that's yeah, that's interesting. I, 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 there may be a lot to say on that. I, I mean, there may be a lot to be said for that. Um, that that's quite interesting. I mean, I, you know, another thing to add to it is it, which which you can see now, of course, in the in the context of the antitrust you know, kind of movement in suits is is that I think that big tech in particular has become something of a boogeyman for anything that either side feels is wrong in in America which which again is a, is a really common trope in responses to innovation right there's you identify something wrong like i was saying before like you identify something wrong and then you figure that the 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 culprit has to be the newest thing and to be sure there are lots of things that are wrong there's lots of things that are wrong in this country and um and and because of the 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 way in which everybody in some way or another has to interact with these giant tech companies, you could, you could certainly make the argument that the things that are wrong touch the tech companies. Now, I think it's a, a, a completely different argument of whether or not these tech companies are creating the things that are wrong. But I think that it's quite telling that, that um, both parties are in agreement that like big tech is bad. Like they, 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 they agree on the boogeyman, but they don't agree with the problem of the boogeyman, right? Um, they don't agree with like what the exact problem is or what the exact solution is, which which I think tells you something. And and, and what it is is that they the, like politically speaking, both sides have grievances that they are very satisfied in laying at the feet of technology, but that they haven't really really connected the dots on how their grievances are caused by the technology. And, and, and in, in a previous conversation we had on the topic, uh, so, someone uh, mentioned this theory that if a technology came out when you were under 15 years old, you grew up with it and thus you, right. you're a fan of it. If it came out after, you know, between sort of 15 and 30 or 15 and 40, I can't recall, then you're, you know, you, you like it, but you might be somewhat skeptical because um, you remember not having it. And if it came out, you know, after you're 45 or something, you, you hate it. Is there is there credence to, to that? I think so. Um I mean, I you know, I haven't done some like longitudinal longitudinal study on it, but um, but I think that that tracks pretty well with like music. And, and this is uh, this is Douglas, whoever the like Generation X writer, I think was the one who who had this theory that that you just said, but kind of applied to music, right? Which is like all the music before you were fifteen or, or whatever the case is. Anyway, you know, I mean, we we see this, I think, in our own habits and patterns that we're very comfortable with the stuff that we grew up with because it's completely natural. And then there's a period of time in which we're very eager to learn new things. And then we kind of slow down and we like what we know. And we're not mostly, and this is obviously a gross generalization, but most people are just not as interested in being pushed into something that's new. And and I, I think part of that could be because of this natural tendency that we have to reject new things as we get older. But, but, you know, I, I think that there's also something to be said for use cases. Like as you get older, there's just, you just see less of a need to know how to do this thing, right? Your peers aren't using it. It's not relevant to your job. You're not looking to reinvent yourself in the way that when you're in your twenties and thirties, you're still kind of like actively figuring out how to reinvent yourself. You just kind of don't need it. And so there's no reason to invest in it. No, I, I, I think like you could see how, People in their fifties and sixties or whatever who who might not have otherwise ever futzed around with Zoom um, are now getting really comfortable with the technology because they're at home and they want to connect with their friends and like my mom wants to play mahjong with her like mahjong group and they're going to do it through Zoom and and uh, and so suddenly there's a different there's a different like use case uh, and um, and so people who it's not like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I think it's like an old dog just kind of isn't interested in the new tricks because they can't figure out how it's relevant to their lives. And, you know, in part, they're right. Totally. And, and so to, if, if we think about the main points that you're trying to get across your book, is it basically that we have this instinct to resist change and we should challenge that instinct and we, we should do so because in history, it significantly held back uh, innovation. Is, is, is that what you're trying to get across or, or how would you edit that? Correct. Yeah, well, so, you know, I mean, there's the, there's the big, there's like the big systemic argument, which is that it holds back innovation. But I tend to like to speak to things as personally as I can, because, you know, I don't think that the average person is sitting around being like, well, it's up to me whether or not to foster innovation in the world. And I don't care about that. But I think that they should and do care about 
their own place in the world and whether they can seize opportunities and whether they can find greatness and change. And so the argument, like this is the kind of summary of my argument. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have, have a book out. It's in so long away that I, I wish I could hawk it, but I don't, I can't. Uh, but anyway, you can, you can find me on social media and eventually I'll hawk it to you. But anyway, you know, my, my argument is this, you come from the future. Like when you think about what we've been talking about this past hour, what you're seeing is that over and over and over again, something new is created, an older generation resists it and sees it as evidence of a decline, and a newer generation adopts it and does not feel that they are a symbol of decline. And that carries to right now, to you and to me and to everybody who's listening to this. We come from the future which is to say we come from somebody else's future. Everything about us, our, everything about our lives, from our lifestyles to our habits, to our interests, to the technology that we use and the clothing that we wear and the music that we listen to, every single thing that we are and that we do and that we love is something that a previous generation thought was bad. But we don't think that we were bad. We don't think we're bad right now. We think that we're good. We think that we are a collection of good things. So good, in fact, that when change comes for us, we are going to resist it. We're going to say, no, 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 no. These things that we have, these are the good things. Those next things, mm -mm, those are the bad things. And then we will just be perpetuating this cycle. So instead, what I want people to do is recognize that change is not inherently bad. And the evidence of that is you, is literally you. Because unless you think that you are a detriment to society, and I don't think that you do, then you are evidence that change is not inherently bad, that change can be good. And so I think that we all have an opportunity at the moment when change comes, or ideally before change comes, when we can just anticipate that change, or we want to be a part of creating that change, that we say change is not inherently bad, it is actually full of opportunity, and let's go shape it together. I love that. And it's interesting because I, I've been thinking of, uh, about a similar argument, but more along the lines of, or, or in the context of free speech. And mm. it's interesting, you know, openness to innovation and openness to speech are, uh, you know, cousins in, in some ways. Yeah, that's, I think that's right. Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, the funny thing about, the funny thing about um, the, the phrase free speech and the way that it's used in America is that people don't, like, don't understand what the term free speech actually is. And, and, and um, right, like free speech doesn't mean that you can like literally say anything anywhere. Um, that's not what we're promised in the Constitution. But, um, but I think that you're right in that I think that more speech is good and that the more opportunities that people have to contribute to the conversation and express their viewpoints – the better that we are. And that's not to say that we're going to create some kind of utopia the second that everybody has a bullhorn. No, obviously not. Instead, what's going to happen is that we're going to create a tremendous amount of noise. But you know what? There was a tremendous amount of noise before. Like, social media didn't invent noise. Uh, you know, go, go back to the early days of, uh, of the Republic and, you know, where every town has like 15 newspapers and they're all run by different party operatives and like it was crazy it was just a crazy mess and we have some version of that now so it's not like we're creating some kind of downfall of society because we've given everybody the opportunity to share their thoughts and raise their voices um it's going to mean that there are going to be a bunch of assholes out there who get too loud uh but it's also going to mean that people who would have not been given the opportunity to share wonderful insights and to become great thinkers of our time uh, who would not have been welcomed into the mainstream gatekeeper media of the 1950s, say, well, now they can start to have their own voice and share their own thoughts and develop their own following. And I don't see how that's bad. Yeah. And and and, and we'll, we'll, we'll close after this, but just for any uh, sort of any of the sort of macroeconomics nerds out there, were there specific time periods that are particularly open for innovation or particularly closed for innovation or sort of commonalities between areas or, or places that were open to new ideas versus, versus not open to ideas in, in any of your research so far? Oh, that's really interesting. That's not a way that I tend to organize my research. So I don't have a great answer to that. Although I, I'm just going to give like a shout out to a guy named Jason Crawford, who has a project called Roots of Progress, who would probably kill at that answer. So it's worth checking out. He, he's really um, tracking the history of progress. But I, but I will share something that, I, that I've learned from uh, from Jason, um, which just kind of speaks to uh, uh, like a little bit of your question. 
which is, uh, you know, that there have been, and this is, this is Jason kind of summarizing a number of other people's research, including the economist Jill Mokier, uh, which is trying to understand why and how innovation as a concept, progress as a concept, suddenly sped up a couple, you know, like four or 500 years ago. Why, why did we go from very, very, very slow, almost non-existent periods of, of innovation, uh, which isn't to say that like there wasn't innovation in the past, right? I mean, like the Romans were great innovators, but, but broadly speaking, why do we go from a lot of very slow nothings to suddenly just, um, you know, come, come like this 1600s, 1700s, like a shocking uh, uh, hockey stick growth that we continue to live in today of, of innovation. And the answer, uh, according to Mokir and others, is that we came out of a long period of ancestor worship. That there was a, you know, this is this is kind of part of the Enlightenment. That we came out of this period in which we believed that everything that needed to be known was known by our ancestors, and that the things that we needed to do in order to live in the world was to study what our ancestors did and what they said and the teachings that they left us, which of course includes religious teachings, and that all the answers would be found there. The very idea of progress just simply didn't exist because if all the answers come from your ancestors, well, then you don't need to build something better than your ancestors. You just need to figure out what your ancestors knew. And then we had a shift, a shift that was driven by many things, including horrible, horrible religious wars. And we came out with this new thought. And this new thought was, we can build better than our ancestors. Our ancestors laid a a foundation that we can build on top of. It was a radical way of thinking about the world, a completely different way of thinking about the world. And you could argue that it led and continues to lead to the things that we have now and yet is also a tension that we continue to have because you'll hear over and over and over again and you still hear it today. It's it's the driving argument, I think, that 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 is still it's infused inside of Tristan Harris's argument, which is a nostalgia narrative that there was a time before us that was better when life was simpler when we were more connected to each other, when you walked onto a bus and people weren't closed off from each other with their phones or if we were talking in 1982, their Walkmen. Instead, they had civil and sparkling conversations with each other, which of course never happened, right? It's not what actually happened. But we are still, I think, very drawn to this idea of a nostalgia narrative. I mean, what does Make America Great Again, if not a nostalgia narrative? We love a nostalgia narrative, that things were better before, that the people who came before us had answers that we have forgotten. And I think we always will live with that tension. And I think that we do better as a society when we are able to move away from nostalgia narratives and we're able to move towards towards an idea that we have the power to build better things, to solve problems for ourselves, instead of constantly looking backwards, backwards, backwards. Yeah, it's in- interesting. Just to go in quick, quick change, it, and I'll, I'll let you go in a, in a, a, few, a few minutes. I, I, um, there was this blog post by Tanner Greer who says, the reason why we're not building as much, because instead of saying, asking ourselves, you know, what can we build? We're asking how can we talk to the manager? <laughs> or, <you> know, <laughs> um, and and that there is um, maybe may, may in environments when inequality gets too, too big or, or something, uh, people start to attack ambition. Um, you know, people showing up with guillotines outside Jeff Bezos' house. Just interesting, I guess, to track sort of like sentiment towards builders o- over time. I have this broader thesis that like Michael Jordan as sort of like ruthless, you know, winner as he was, like he couldn't have been that today just because, We've sort of softened, uh, and, and in some ways for good, in some ways not for good, as a as a culture. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that there's also just a tendency to support. I mean, it's like even I don't know that we go through periods now where we are opposed to builders, but we 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 like builders. We like we like the underdog. We like somebody who's going out and solving a problem. What we culturally don't like is someone who feels powerful and untouchable. And so if you grow a company 
the way that Jeff Bezos has grown a company, you eventually go from being this weirdo guy with an online bookstore to somebody who feels powerful and untouchable. And I and we I think that we culturally just don't like that. We want to at once I mean I guess it's another tension of ours. We we want to grow and we want to flatten at the same time. And, and I think that that tension leads to trusting somebody up until a certain level of success at which point you distrust them. I mean right I mean you know you brought up LeBron or Michael Jordan you could I think that you could you could make that case with LeBron James too right I mean LeBron James went from somebody that everybody rooted for to that a lot of people root against simply because he's been so successful like at some point there's just a tipping point in which people we feel like somebody has too much success and we want to see them humble and I guess why we want to do that is a question I'll leave up to psychologists. Uh, I don't know the answer, but I, I do feel like it's a pattern that I see. Awesome. That's a perfect place to, to wrap. Um, my guest has been Jason Pfeiffer. Uh, Jason, for people who want to learn more, uh, where can you point them to? Yeah. So, uh, so thanks a lot. And thanks for this great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I'll give you three things um, to do. Number one, of course, if you want to check out the stuff that we're talking about is very much based on my podcast. It's called Pessimist Archive. As of now, we will be changing the name, but we will be keeping Pessimist Archive. So you can still, at any time that you're listening to this, you can go to the um, your app store and just search Pessimist Archive and um, you'll find you'll find the old name or the new name that also contains um, the old name. Uh, and, um, and then also, uh, I'd love if you went to my website, it's Jason Pfeiffer, J-A-S-O-N, F as in Frank, E I F and Frank, ER.com, because you will be prompted to sign up for a newsletter. I put out a newsletter uh, every month with insights from entrepreneurs that I've talked to um, largely about this subject that we're talking about now, which is change, how people are managing change in their own lives and in their own businesses. I just find it an extremely important subject and something that I feel like um, we can never really have enough reminders on. And then um, finally, uh, if you happen to be uh, an Instagrammer, like I said, I'm kind of obsessed with Instagram. Instagram. So at Hey Pfeiffer, you can find me there. DM me. I respond to everything. Awesome. Uh, Jason, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a great episode. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate it. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.